talk about the actual things that I'm responsible for. My first. And uh, I expect many of you have questions because one thing that we do uh, in my team is in addition to collecting journals for the for coverage in the core collection of the Web of Science, we also answer many questions that are coming from. And I'm not going to get into the issue of the information overload. Um, everybody at this uh, conference talked about it, about the explosion of information and how much information there is around. Um, I'm actually going to share uh, one different aspect with you that we're encountering at, uh, in editorial. More recently, um, I talked to some of the participants at the conference and they admitted that they know of the problem. And uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, real short, shortly mentioned uh, the issue of the pitfalls of the open access. So uh, what we have noticed that the, at the um, editorial department, once the uh, open access really fell through with the majority of the publishers, uh, and things that probably happen all over the internet is that basically anybody can publish anything. It's different from print, that used to be a more controlled uh, process, and it was much more expensive. So nowadays, it is cheaper to publish anything. So uh, sometimes things happen uh, by the principle garbage in, garbage out. So very poorly uh, constructed articles are submitted to a questionable journal and then that particular journal wants to gain uh, attention so that it can attract more authors and particularly so if they also charge for publication. So the um, pay for publish model is unfortunately used by many predatory, we call them predatory publishers and journals. And I, uh, in, in a, instead of talking about, um, about this and how much is published, I want to um, to give you a piece of advice. We tell this to every author because we have a situation almost every day. Um, let's say a researcher worked uh, maybe his entire life or maybe a few years on a discovery. He perfected the research. He has the article ready and now where to publish. Major journals don't accept it. So what do they do? They go the easy route. They submit this journal to a, 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 a article to a journal, and the journal says, "Fine, we will publish your article in 10 days. We have our very fast peer review, and you can imagine that a peer review that happens in 10 days is really questionable. So I don't even know how they find the people so fast. Of course, they don't." Uh, you can. You would only have to send five hundred dollars to this bank account in Nigeria, and then we will publish your article. And and you would not believe how many such situations we have. It's a. I, I even would call it a tragic situation. So I'm not going to go into the issue of the predatory publishers, predatory journals, even hijacked journals. So I have to warn you about this. What's happening now? So let's say um, a journal is covered by the Thompson Writers Core Connection. It has a lot of prestige because everybody wants to be covered there. It, it, it's um, actually, no, I'm going to tell you the name of the journal, Wolfenia. It's a plant sciences journal that is published irregularly, maybe once a year, by a very small society in Austria. But only in print. And the journal is covered. It's a, it's a very well-known, established, old journal published by a serious society in Austria. So what happened is this predatory entity, we don't know who it is, hijacked, we call it, this journal. And what they did is they published, they came up with a modern thing to do, right? They published a website. And the website was www.volpenia.something, or probably. So uh, a young researcher wants to publish in this journal. The other phenomenon that happens, and I have to warn you against it, is usually they pick a print uh, journal that is pretty much small from from a country that would not protest too much. So a small country like Austria. And they turn this very specific plant sciences journal into a multidisciplinary journal. Why? So that anybody and everybody can publish anything, provided that they pay 
$400 per article, $600 per article, and so on. So those people get rich from this. And um, I wanted to warn you about this. So the, the, conclusions, the conclusion would be, instead of talking about information overload, uh, be very careful if you are an author, or if you are a publisher, or a department, or a chair of a certain specialty. Um, <coughs> Make sure that you advise your PhD candidates or your researchers first to investigate. Where do I publish? Is this a really a, a, a serious source of publishing? And what they do is, uh, unfortunately, they abuse the master journalist. I'm going to show it to you in my presentation, which is the free list of um, Thomson Reuters cover journals. We are working now on refining that list so that it really includes only the journals that are covered in the Web of Science core collection. Because initially the list also included some hosted content, some associated content such as zoological record and so on. And then these predatory publishers used the, uh, the title that was actually listed on the Web of Science free, in this free available information resource, to claim that they are covered and that they have an impact factor. Some of them even have an impact factor on their website. And it's a fake one, of course, because if the journal is not covered, it doesn't have an impact factor. But, but an innocent, uh, uh, unsuspecting author rushes in, pays that fee to that bank in whatever, and thinks, OK, fine, I published my article. And that's the very bad, the, the worst situation that we have. So, uh, uh, I'm going to pass quickly through this because you've seen it probably often. Why do we have, why don't we cover all journals that actually are published? Because we are a comprehensive database, the largest database, the most trustworthy. And uh, if we say that we are so comprehensive, we should actually cover everything. Well, we cannot cover everything, and, uh, and uh, we actually should not cover everything because it was demonstrated uh, by several scientists and researchers that actually a very small number of journals publish the main information, the most relevant, the, the most impactful, um, most recent science in general. The problem is that a, a scientist or a researcher is just human himself and he cannot read all that's published. So he's capable of reading maybe a very small percentage of articles. And what we're trying to do with the selection that we're performing at Web of Science is to give him these 200 titles. So what we want to do is um, cut through the noise and the clutter and really give a clear signal. This is what you actually should be reading. This is what you should be researching. And um, I want to stress it again because I don't think it's stressed enough. Uh, many other uh, database publishers are claiming that they're doing this, but it, it's actually not done the way we're doing it at Thomson uh, Writers. We have a team of 12 subject specialists who are um, definitely uh, specialists in their field, who have been with the company. Nobody is there with the company for less than 15 years. Some of them are with the company for more than 25 years. In other words, they have built this collection, the collection that they are responsible for um, over the years. They know the collection very well. Um, not only do, do, are they specialists in the field, but uh, having contact with so many journals, basically all journals that are of any importance globally, they know the new trends. They, and, and using the tools that we have now at our disposal, we hope to be able, with the new evaluation system, to even discover new trends, so that we are ahead of time, so that we make decisions faster and uh, actually um, serve the customers even before they even know it. Let's say a new field emerges, such as uh, was nanotechnology a few years past, we will be ahead of time hopefully and uh, start covering those journals before that uh, specialty even establishes itself as a separate specialty. So um, another word of uh, caution about uh, the journal selection process. Everybody wants to be in the web of science or the, in the ISI list or in the Philadelphia list or whatever you want to call it. The correct name at this point as we evolved through the many years since Dr. Garfield initially established the company, the current name is Web of Science. 
And the web of science is actually a universe of very many products, some of them are associated products. And in order to enrich our content, we are constantly uh, adding and collaborating with scientists all over the world to add content from um, citation index indexes in other countries, such as the Chinese citation index, the Korean citation index, and so on. But those uh, journals are not necessarily covered in the core collection. So what is the core collection? The core collection is really the top. There are the top tier, most influential, carefully curated titles that are covered in the Social Science Citation Index, in the Science, uh, Science Citation Index Expanded, we call it. And if you have questions, I can answer um, after that what's the difference between the Science Citation Index and the Science Citation Index Expanded. I'm afraid I've run out of time. What's happening here? So um, I'm, I'm going real fast. And uh, um, there are other indexes for which our team selects. The book citation index is very important, and it's specifically important for the arts and humanities and the social sciences, where everybody knows that most of the researchers actually do not publish in journals, but they publish in books, in serial books or serial publications, and the proceedings. So um, the, the, my team, the editorial team that's comprised of those subject specialists actually evaluates only the, the top tier journals. We evaluate many, but we add them to the top tier collection, which is called the core collection. And only those journals have um, an impact factor. So those were the only journals that will be ranked in the journal citation reports. Um, this I mentioned already, so we are considered the gold standard by uh, covered and used by thousands of uh, universities worldwide. Our mission as uh, editorial development is actually twofold. And uh, it, this is very important because uh, conferences uh, such as this one includes people who are looking for solutions. So they, they are, I assume that you're here not only to find out how can I submit my journal and how will it be accepted, but if it wasn't accepted, and this is the question that we are answering every day at the editorial. If my journal was rejected, why did you reject it? What's wrong with it? When I, when I submitted it, I thought that I'm meeting all the requirements that you're listing, and still you did not add it. So what are the reasons? And um, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I want to, to advise you that we're working on a system so that we make these results results much more clear. We're working on a new system that will offer um, a visual image of the actual evaluation. Um, the system is in processing now, and we hope to be able to implement it at the latest next year. As with anything, programmers take a long time to work on this, but we are currently testing it, and we hope to be able to promote it. So why did I mention that? Because our uh, job is twofold. First of all, we select those um, top tier journals to be included and used by the uh, customers worldwide. But at the same time, we constantly collaborate with publishers so that we find best practices and we can advise on how to publish the best journal and how to improve the publishing quality in general. Uh, how many journals do we evaluate? I already explained why we don't cover all of them. So our team really covers a tremendous amount of work. Uh, we evaluate approximately 4,000 journals every year. And I told you it's just a team comprised of 30 people. So it's a lot of work. And they go through every evaluation from the beginning to the end and then they have the results. In these 4,000 uh, numbers, these are not all new journals that are submitted. Because what we do, and that's why I mentioned curation, is we evaluate the journals that are already covered already. So those, once a journal is accepted, it does not mean that it's carved in stone and it will stay there forever. And I think um, this isn't also stressed enough, because other databases add the journal, it's in the list there, and that's where it stays, regardless if it changes its title, if in the meantime it stops publishing for various reasons, the title appears there. So when the user goes to, to a certain database, they would say, oh my god, they cover 40,000 journals, so this is the best. 
um, what I can assure you is that this team really curates, and I want to stress that word, which means that we analyze not only new journals that are submitted, but we constantly um, analyze our collection in the similar way that the librarian would curate his own collection in the library, so that to make sure that he does not cover obsolete information, that the, the book, the journal that we cover uh, hasn't stopped publishing in the meantime. Sometimes the editor dies or something and the journalist stops publishing. So what's the point of listing that journal? Uh, it will be misleading for a user to find that. So we evaluate approximately 4,000 of this type of journals. And also, uh, it is worth mentioning, because probably there will be a question, I'm trying to, to anticipate questions because I'm familiar with these questions. Like I said, we answer many questions every day, so that's part of our job. So people ask, so what happened? Okay, you rejected my journal, I'm desperate, I'm going to work on it, I promise that I will improve it, so uh, is it rejected forever? No. The answer is no. Uh, we have a reevaluation schedule and we established that since we collect data, we need data for three years, so the citing years and two back years. And we established this evaluation schedule to be three years. In other words, the journal was submitted last year. We needed to monitor that journal for a certain period of time because we needed to see several issues in order to form an informed opinion. And uh, this year, the journal actually did not meet the criteria which I will address in this presentation. And what happens? It's rejected. It, it receives a date of evaluation, of a finalized evaluation result of rejection. And it is already planned for a re-evaluation three years from now. So, so the evaluation schedule, re-evaluation schedule, we call it, is three years. It was rejected this year, but then why do we offer this? And we explain to the editor who usually is upset, of course, about this result. We try to explain what the weaknesses of the journals were, and I told you that to, just to, to uh, stay uh, abreast, because we are going to come up with a tool to offer more information to that particular editor who had his journal rejected, more clear information. And we offer advice on how to improve the journal. But uh, these changes do not happen over time. Everybody understands that in order to collect more citations, for instance, it needs time. So we established that this th three years is uh, a fair and generous uh, time interval to evaluate the journals. However, and this is a caveat, and it doesn't, I know it doesn't sound too good. Uh, we have journals that are, for instance, already in the 25th volume, which means that they live for 25 years, uh, they are really poorly cited, uh, which means they, they have little chance to go. They are rejected. For such a journal that really does not change anything, in other words, it is an established journal, but its performance during these 25 years wasn't really that great. And when we evaluated it, it did not meet the minimum criteria, or it met the minimum criteria, but it would not increase the value of our product for our users. Um, and we rejected it. A second rejection follows in six years. In other words, I rejected it now. I'm looking at it again to see if it improved. It actually did not improve. So then it will qualify for a re-evaluation in six years. And uh, who can submit a journal for evaluation? And this is a, an easy answer. We have a, a, a link to a form on our website. Of course, it will be available. Um, it is the publisher relations uh, website, actually. If you fill out the form with as much information as is requested, some of the information is necessary because uh, not every uh, John, Dick, and Harry can submit a journal. Some people just put in uh, information there and we found that it's cluttered in the system. So really a serious submission should include basic information about the journal. And what we recommend nowadays since we need uh, uh, XML feeds, or really access, even if it is open access, we need the technical people to look and see if can we access the content. We suggest that the journal is submitted through the publisher. So if you are an author and you want to uh, suggest that we cover a journal, we suggest that you address the publisher and then the publisher will submit an official request for evaluation. And I think that's the safest route. Because, it, because then it gets to publisher relations, they create a record, they have a record of all journals that are 
currently under evaluation. And moreover, uh, if, let's say, half a year from now or a year from now, you want information and you want to know, so how am I standing, what's the evaluation doing, have you started it, uh, at what stage is it, when will I get a reply, publisher relations will be the department to give you that information. Publisher relations also gives information on long lists of uh, journals that are published by the same publisher. So sometimes, for instance, Wiley would come in and say, we need a, a half year report of all our journals that are currently under evaluation. What's the status? And then it, got, it comes to the editorial department and we give them the status on, on each journal. So basically anybody can uh, submit a journal. Um, another question that, uh, basically this presentation answers a lot of questions that we get every day. So another question, and, and people, I understand that they might be suspicious uh, and say, fine, I really don't do research in a very uh, well-known field. Um, I could not uh, afford to submit to a major publisher. And I'm, I'm a little anxious, and I think that you at the editorial uh, development team will not give my journal the same attention that you would a major publisher. And the answer is no. Uh, and I can assure you, I, I know the people on the team, they basically love their material, they love their collection, they are all very consistent and totally objective. So what we are doing is we evaluate each journal only based on its own merits, regardless of who publishes it, uh, how, how major the publisher is, what the prestige of the publisher is, um, the country that it's coming from, the language that it's coming from, provided that it meets the criteria that I will be talking about. So this is something very important to remember. If you work on a journal and it turns out to be a very good journal, please don't be afraid that we don't give it the same attention that we would a journal from a major publisher. We don't. If it, if it fits into the uh, criteria and we are sure, the editor who evaluates it is sure that that journal would be rich coverage and would be a gain for our customers, we will add it. So, uh, um, one thing that, other thing that I want to mention, often we get a question, okay, fine, so uh, you have, uh, we have several editors who have their different fields, but uh, uh, what we do is we meet every two weeks. Uh, in, a, in a board meeting, and basically every editor has to submit the presentation, the result, and support his decision. In other words, we present at that meeting the journals that we suggest for uh, coverage, that we have accepted, so that everybody keeps, the, and this keeps at level and, and uh, um, helps us make uniform decisions. In other words, uh, uh, the social sciences editor will be not more strict with with one of, or the other of the elements than the clinical medi medicine editor. We want to keep a homogeneous uh, approach to all journals. And that's why we believe that we discuss these things. So uh, the same thing happens with uh, journals that are uh, suggested for being dropped from coverage, because I didn't mention that. I probably mentioned it, but I didn't stress it. Um, the collection is stable. We want it to be stable. In other words, we want users, when they go there, to be certain that they find journals that uh, have uh, consistently been covered by us, provided that they meet the criteria, they continue to meet the criteria. But if journals stop meeting criteria, they have to be dropped from coverage. So in addition to adding, uh, curating, we also sometimes have to suggest journals to be dropped from coverage. And I will explain when, and if you have questions, I can answer them when that happens. Uh, the whole uh, process is explained freely on our website through our essay, and I promise that we're working on re revamping this essay as well. Uh, we are trying to make it more explanatory, more visual, and this will probably happen after we implement the new evaluation system. The new evaluation system does not mean that we change our criteria. So the criteria will stay the same. We are simply using for better and uh, more enlightening tools to uh, evaluate and to explain to the users how we do it. So uh, the selection process. This is the other free resource that we have, which is the journal master list, and I told you already that we are refining this one as well. And mostly we do it in order to avoid confusion that usually happens with those predatory journals that I talked about. Uh, a lot of the users go in here and they might find a title uh, that is in the list because
because it's covered only in zoological record. The zoological record is a historical, very prestigious record, the oldest record. I think they celebrate it years or something since publishing, but those journals are not necessarily covered in the core collection and they don't have an impact factor. And sometimes um, people who have, I don't know, less honest intentions use this confusion in order to uh, collect money from those paper published uh, poor authors who send them money. So the free resource has to be really looked at uh, with caution. There is a button there that says coverage, and if you click on that button, it explains what products the journal is covered in. But no, we found that not many people do that. Unfortunately, they don't click on everything. So what are the four points of the evaluation? I include this on Spanish so that you know where we are on this slide we are. Um, the four uh, steps of the evaluation, it's, it's a rather um, transparent process. So we're looking at um, basic journal publishing standards, editorial content, international diversity, and citation analysis. And I'm going to explain them in, in short one by one. If you continue to have questions about them, I will try to answer them at the end. One thing to be said about this slide is, and that's another question that we're getting, um, none of these factors especially not citation analysis, are decisive. It is always a complete picture. So think, think of a famous painting, right? If so, somebody showed you Mona Lisa or something, the Conda, you know, Da Vinci's famous painting, and you only saw an ear. I even think that she doesn't really have very good ears. So anyway, you have to look at the whole thing in order to appreciate it. This is what we do with our journals. None of these factors is looked at in isolation. The, uh, the editor analyzes each and every one of them based on certain criteria and how it fits into our collection. And the general picture is the, is the one that generates the result. Not one single factor. In the, in the evaluation decision, of course, some of them are really obvious and some of them don't meet, meet basic criteria. And then you can tell somebody, your journal is always late. So that's one of the basic criteria. It doesn't even go any further. But usually journals that meet all of the criteria, they just don't fit in the, in the general collection. They have a complex picture, like I said. So timeliness is essential. It is, a, it is a, an eliminatory um, criteria. And what do we request? We request uh, three to see a minimum of three issues. And I want to clarify this also because this is the confusion. I don't know if it's an intens intentional confusion or, or sometimes it, it is unintentional. But we, we keep telling people, uh, regardless of the publication schedule, with the exception of animals, for animals we don't request three annuals. It's sufficient to see two. So if you have an annual and you submit it this year, uh, we will look at this year's issue and then we'll need just one more issue in order to finalize the evaluation. And that's for obvious reasons. But if the journal has a publication schedule, which most of them are um, either bi-monthly or quarterly or whatever it is, we need to see a minimum of three consecutive issues. And that means the following. So it is not, not uh, by coincidence that the frame there includes July, September, November, because the journals are submitted throughout the year. And of course, uh, let's say the schedule for uh, quarterly would be uh, January, March, September, and December. Uh, if, the, if the journal was submitted in July, we want to see the most recent issue. The most recent issue is not January. I want to stress that. The most in the recent issue is the most recent issue closer to that date. So which was the most recent issue? I said March. So the journal will be submitted with that issue. And then we will need to see a minimum of two more. So we want to see the June issue and the September issue, or the September and the December issue, depending how the journal announces the, the publishing schedule. So um, this means three consecutive issues. The mistakes that are made is people here three, and then we, we get all sorts of variations. We either get three issues of the same number, or we get three issues in one package, and we get January, March, and May, and that's not correct, because we don't have space for January and March. Uh, if you visited our office, you would see that we have, next to the department where the editors are sitting, we have a big room, which is 
called the library, and it's a library that has shelves from, from floor to ceiling that are full with journals, uh, print journals. And it's a pretty big, it's not a pretty big, but anyway, all the, all the shelves are full with journals. And that's only a fraction of the journals, because nowadays everybody has in their own computer list upon list of electronic journals. So um, we have no space. So guess what happens? When, when the uh, people who record the, uh, at the reception those journals, the first two issues will be thrown out. And it's a shame because somebody paid for, for posting. But we don't look at those issues. We want to see the most current issue and starting from that particular day, two more. A minimum of two more. So um, this is important. Uh, the, next, the, the next criteria, so if the journal does not meet those basic criteria, we wait until the journal publishes on time. And, and we even suggest if somebody uh, sends us issues and we realize that the journal is not publishing on time, uh, the next steps will not follow. Because uh, uh, remember that number that I told you, the, the editorial team evaluates 4,000 journals a year. We have to prioritize that somehow. And this is the first step of prioritization. If the journal is not publishing on time, we wait until it publishes on time. Before we even go ahead and, and the, the rest of the work. So um, the journal has to meet a basic international editorial convention. And since we gather uh, over 18 items for every record in an uh, authority file for a citation, the minimum requirements for international bibliographic conventions would be those listed there. The journal has, it is preferable that it has an informative title. Nowadays, a lot of these journals that pop up on the internet, like uh, mushrooms, are called International Journal of Science. So what does that mean? Nothing. It needs to have an informative title. In other words, tell me what kind of journal is this? Um, it needs to include fully descriptive article titles and abstracts, with the exception of humanities. In humanities, metaphorical titles are acceptable because it's a completely different field. And uh, of course, we need to have full address information for every author. I'm going to tell you something funny here. Recently, I replied to, to an editor, I think it was a journal editor, uh, and he said, um, and I said, we, we cannot uh, proceed with the evaluation of your journal because you do not provide the address of the author. And he said, our author does not want to give you his address. So we're not asking for his personal address. I'm talking here about the address of the institution that this author is affiliated with. I'm not interested in sending him flowers for Mother's Day. I, what I want is I want the... But unbelievable people ask those questions. So I, I never got this one, so that's why I remember that I thought maybe I'll share it with you, because I found it really hilarious. So we want the uh, address of the institution where the research was conducted or whatever institution that a particular author is affiliated with. And obviously that's an important thing for the institution, for the department to complete the author's profile and so on. So uh, that's why complete bibliographic information is needed for all cited references. Why? Because as a citation database, Web of Science, Thomson Reuters collects citations uh, with all those elements as well, otherwise we wouldn't be able to build the citation records and the journal citation reports and all the other analytical tools that were provided. And this is very important. So we want to know who those people are who cited that particular article. And uh, uh, this is probably of relevance here. Uh, we require, since the Web of Science is an English language database, and you've heard this many times before, uh, English is the language of science, and the database is published in English, we require that the basic uh, elements of the article are in English. It, it does not matter if the full text is in a different language. And here I'm going to say in a parenthesis that among the editorial team, we manage 11 languages. So I don't think that there is one editor who speaks just one language. So we manage um, Chinese, Tagalog, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Catalan, Portuguese, uh, Romanian, and so on. So the, the individual editors are capable of reading into the text. 
but we don't require that the text be in English. We require that the bibliographic information be in English. In other words, the, um, the, the TOC, the table of contents should be in English, the article uh, title should be in English, and here I have to say something. I, and maybe you can give me an answer. We received many journals from Spain and from Latin America who have very well translated abstracts, but they don't include the Journal, the, the article title in Spanish, uh, in English. So I don't understand that. But, uh, I, I worked as a translator myself in the beginning of my career in the United States, and we were required to translate title and abstract. So I don't understand if somebody uh, publishes a journal, why would they spend money for a translator to translate the abstract, but they actually don't translate the title? Does anybody know? <laughs> but you've seen that, right? So we don't understand that obviously such a journal does not meet the requirements because the article title is not there. So we require English information for references as well. So that's essential and I, I'm going to tell you again why. Because we collect all the references to that article in the If the references are not, at least in the Roman alphabet, we won't be able to capture them. So we do some translation. We have a, a translation a service that we're using that occasionally it has to translate, but if the references are not, or the, the text, or the, the other bibliographic information is not in the Roman alphabet, we are not uh, processing. Uh, we receive many other and journals, those that are published from back to front, and even though some of them will be very nice, we cannot handle them. So, um, article titles, author names, and addresses, and cited the reference have to be in the Roman a different situation is with uh, arts and humanities journals, and those are the, the they constitute the main body of work for the translation scheme because it's obvious something that speaks on um, Spanish poetry in the 19th century, uh, and it may refer to uh, an original work that was that was never translated uh, it would have to be in Spanish, and that some we accept that. So for arts and humanities, we have a uh, special treatment. So we uh, accept. Uh, Provided that there is no alphabet, we accept foreign text as well and foreign bibliographic information, and they will go to translation. It takes a little longer to process those journals, but it still happens. So uh, we also collect uh, uh, information on peer review. That frame there didn't come up nice on this, but that's okay. I'm going to tell you. So we're looking at peer review, which is really a stamp of approval that that particular journal was really worked through the editor of the journal did this job and it is a, a journal worth look, looking at, it's trustworthy. And we also collect uh, funding information. And that all of these things are searchable in the web of science. If you are familiar with the web of science, you can search upon all of those and create your own mark list and, and your own research and your own dashboards. And that's very important. So the next chapter is editorial content. And here things um, may or may not be considered uh, complicated. And I think here is the, uh, the uh, criterion where the experience and the knowledge of the editors is most uh, valued. Because like I said, the editor knows the field. Uh, looking at so many new journals every day, he knows the trends, he knows what's hot, uh, he knows what's needed, So, and he also knows what the, our customers request. Because you have to remember that we have our own customers, just as every publisher does. We have to, uh, to address the needs of those customers. So if something is new, it has never been published, somebody approached me in the corridor and said that they are publishing a, a journal on, uh, I think it was uh, plant sciences in a certain area of Latin America. Yes, by all means, yes. It's a unique thing. Uh, somebody who was uh, publishing uh, uh, articles uh, in, I don't know, who was a, a botanist in Norway would not travel to Latin America to study in the field the situation of the unique plants and the unique names and discoveries here. It is unique. Focus on that. So if there is a place where you want to focus your funding, focus on something unique because then the chances of being uh, read and, and raising attention in the academic community and the chances of being covered by us uh, increase tremendously. So it is very important that uh, a new journal 
cover something that has not been covered before, that is not covered in our database, because often uh, a journal would meet all the criteria, and then we have to reject it and tell the, that particular editor. Unfortunately, we already covered this issue in our database extensively by many well-cited journals. So uh, we, we have financial restrictions as well, and also processing restrictions. We cannot process everything. So if a field is already very well covered by established and valuable journals, there is no uh, gain for our customers, and there is no uh, reason for us to spend money on adding a new journal and processing a new journal that's dealing already with something that is covered. So focus on something new. So the editors are looking for something unique, um, a new point of view, and so on. Is the subject already covered in our database? Will it enrich our, our database with, with some content that our users will be interested in? Uh, how do we do that? Of course, like I told you, the journals are grouped by categories, and this is very important. We never compare pears to oranges. We want to compare uh, apples to apples and pears to pears and so on, because journals have different uh, citation patterns and uh, di different uh, behaviors, depending on what, what uh, field they're coming from. So we're looking at that particular field. Sometimes a field is covered in several categories. I think we have uh, more than five psychology categories with all the subdivisions. Psychology applied, psychology experimental, psychology clinical, and so on. So if a psychology journal comes in, the editor who knows his or her collection will compare that journal to the journals that are already covered in the field. And we can do that in several ways. We either do searches in the web of science, where this is possible, and you are probably familiar with those searches. We look at the journal citation reports that actually list these journals journals by category, and we compare all the elements of those journals to those that are already covered. Uh, we look at the journals that uh, cite that particular journal to establish the community of, of researchers who are interested in that particular topic. Um, and here comes in the, I can weave in the next topic, which is international diversity. Uh, I think if you read our essay, it will be a little misleading because it says a journal needs to have international diversity. And uh, if I can uh, make a point with uh, the, the team that will uh, discuss and, and elaborate the, the new description of our selection criteria, I will have to always connect that to the target audience. In other words, um, if you decide to publish an international journal, what do you do? You establish the scope and aim of the journal. I intend to publish a national journal, an international journal on neurology. What does that mean? I assume to be able to attract contributors from many countries because I call it an international journal. I assume that I will read topics that are of international relevance and I expect to get sites from just as many international um, citing peers because it is an international journal of, of international um, scope and, and description and everything. If I intend to publish a, a regional journal, my scope is going to be completely different. If I intend to publish a journal on a very specific niche topic, which I said is beneficial because it, would, it might cover something that is not covered in our database, that is a completely different target audience. So, uh, because we have this situation, uh, somebody, uh, a publisher in Korea, let's say, they are desperately trying to enter into the web of science and make their mark. So, they only get Korean contributors. Uh, most of the uh, articles are full text Korean. They provide basic requirements. They learn that. They we collaborate with them. But when we look at the people who read that journal and cite that journal, we find, guess what? Who is citing it? Koreans. So why is it called international journal? The, the problem with that journal is not that it's from Korea, about Korea, and cited by Korea. The problem is that the editor will compare that journal with other international journals that are very well cited that are probably and most likely at the top of their category in the ranking. So that journal will stand a very small chance of being added. And 
The reason is because it claims to be an international journal, or it aims to be an international journal. And then we suggest you may want to rethink your aims and scope. If you think that you are treating this subject and it only raises awareness in the Korean community, focus on that and don't call it an international journal anymore. So that's international diversity. And here are examples um, of a topic, clinical infectious diseases. Obviously, clinical infectious diseases is different from neurological research. Why? You probably have somebody in clinical here who would be able to explain why. Neurological issues might be general clinical, pathological, or general physiological issues that every human on the globe encounters. However, infectious diseases might be specifically connected to a certain region. Think of Ebola or something that is very relevant. It might be very regional. So even um, uh, journals on, uh, that are ranked uh, in the category of clinical medicine or pathology or something might not be the same. One might be regional by definition or by topic, and the other one might be very international by topic. So that, that's what the editor expects. If something is covering the neurological research, we expect it to be international. Even if it doesn't say that it's international. It will be international because it's a general topic treated by the entire humanity. If it's not, and if it covers something like the Asian Pacific Journal of Allergy and Immunology, again, what allergies? Allergies that are created by pathogens that might be encountered just in Asia. So obviously it's a regional journal. It might be of interest for international travel, but basically it would be a regional journal. So um, we had a um, specific project recognizing the importance of regional journals. We conducted this project. It was basically finished. We, we uh, awarded the opportunity for uh, regional journals that are not very well cited, but that meet the basic criteria to be added in the database. It, I would now, in, with hindsight, uh, consider this uh, an experiment. Because what happened is we uh, gave a lot of regional journals the opportunity of being covered. They still met all the criteria. The only thing that they did not meet is basically they were not very well cited. And then I explained that that's not a negative thing in itself. What it means is that they raise a, a smaller circle of attention. But somebody, some of the journals always have to be at the bottom of the category. N not everybody can be at the top. There is a ranking. If a category has 300 journals, some of them will be consistently in the top uh, 50, and some will be in the middle, and some will be at the bottom. Some of those at the bottom will fall out and will be dropped because they don't meet the criteria. But others we follow, and we keep them there for year after year after year because this is where they belong. This is how many citations they raise. The, that particular impact factor of the ranking is just a number. And it's a relational correlation to the other journals in the category. So it's not a bad thing to be in the, in the, fourth, in the fourth quarter of the category, provided that you stay there. And the, the initial criteria for which that journal was accepted stay the same and don't go down, which happens to the journal that is being dropped. So uh, what we did with this project is we added a very large number of journals, um, 1,600 journals, and now uh, the project was finished in 2009. And guess what happened? Some of the journals really benefited from coverage in the web of science. In other words, it increased their um, acceptance in the community. This is what's expected. This is what every journal tells us. We are not cited because you don't cover it. And you don't want to accept us because we're not cited. So here we offer them the possibility. And a lot of them um, came from this coverage. In other words, they, they were able to attract contributors. They improved their performance. Not necessarily the ranking. They are still where they were when they were accepted. But they are still covered. And a lot of them actually did not. Which means that they had a little peak of, of uh, citation when we added it. But when we looked at that journal after the year 2009 when the project was finished, we had to drop them because they no longer met the requirements. We're still adding regional journals, as I mentioned that, because we, we think that regional coverage is important and it enriches the value of our product. It definitely does. There are many regions that are underrepresented, and one of them is Latin America. 
uh, sadly enough, for various reasons that probably your publishers and, and bigger bodies will analyze. Uh, I don't think uh, enough is published. So how the how the volume some top journals will really emerge? But one of these uh, underrepresented regions, Latin America, gained from this, especially Brazil, as you can see. Not all the countries are represented here, but uh, the part of the column that is, uh, I don't know, maroon, kind of red, is the growth during this period of the region, the region expansion. One example that I can give you, Turkey, if you look at Turkey in that frame, look how many journals we covered from Turkey. Uh, less than uh, 10, probably, and we had it a lot. Guess what happened to Turkey because they did not keep the requirements at the time when it happened? That red column fell down because a lot of those journals were dropped. So that's what happened with them. The phenomenon that they explained before. When we added them, we hoped that they would do good, but they did not. So a lot of them were dropped. Um, this I will not repeat because I have touched on it already. So in order to be a good regional journal, you still have to meet all the requirements. But you have to bring something new. Bring something new, something unique, something that you know will enrich our coverage. And how can you do that? You research our current coverage using our products. You want to look, is this already covered in the web of science or am I going to enrich it with something? And when you submit the journal, you can point that out. So the editor will be very grateful if you offer a presentation and say, this is what my journal brings new. I think that it will enrich your collection because I'm treating something that, that you currently don't cover and it helps the editor. And finally, the citation analysis. And this is probably the most sensitive issue. And uh, sadly enough, everybody thinks that this is the deciding factor. So the journal was accepted because it's well cited, or the journal was dropped because it's not cited, and uh, if I improve my citations any way I can, uh, it will be accepted. And that's of course not true. The citation analysis is just part element, because remember what I said at the beginning, it's a complete picture. So something that is very well cited but does not enrich the coverage and will be a burden to process because the topic is already covered will not be added. Um, we research the citations, of course, in the web of science, which is global by anybody. Anybody can, can research that if they are cited or not. Uh, we also do it with an internal database because uh, we collect citations from journals that we cover, but we also collect that this is very important. So citations of journals that we do not cover. Those data we cannot release to the outside because they did not go through the curation process that uh, cover journals does. Because sometimes people ask, okay, fine, you, you say that I was cited in the World of Science third times, but look, I, I'm cited on Google 300 times. We don't care. Because we care what the journals that we cover cite. Because we already established that those are the most important journals. So this is, this is how we think that we keep the promise that we made to our customers. We promise to cover the best, and the top, and if we collect collection, if we consider and, and take into account citations that come from other resources, those are not trusted. Why are they not trusted? Because they are not curated like our material. So that's why we consider only the citations that come from the web of science. Um, and like I said, this, these are probably more familiar screens for you. Uh, one thing that I want to draw attention to is the right column there where it says time cited. And uh, uh, we can establish if a journal is self or an author is self citing itself, and that's not a good thing. So I, I want to, to raise awareness of that. Uh, many editors uh, unfortunately think that if they, if they suggest, or some, some of them even require of their contributors, I will admit your article if you promise to cite our journal. And uh, you, I see some smiles, and, and I think that you admit that it may have happened to you. So we are aware of that. We have a way of detecting that, and it's not a good thing. So self-citation is not good whether it's a journal level or an author level. And something it's not good uh, either if uh, editorial board members are cited by the authors, or the other way around or if the editorial board members are those who publish articles in their journal themselves. I remember a journal on 
um, arachnology. So it's one of my fields of biology and entomology. Uh, and it was a couple from, I don't know, Switzerland, husband and wife, who studied spiders. They were publishing the journal. They were, um, they were the, the publishers, they were the uh, editorial board, and guess what articles were included in the journal? Their articles. And they were citing their articles, so they wanted to be covered by all the science, which of course did not happen. So um, this is a formula for the journal uh, impact factor, and you probably know it. It's a very simple formula. We look at citations received in, a, in the last year that we had. Now we are in 2014. We are not looking at the 2014 uh, sites, 2, 13, and 12. Why? Because the 2014 year is not complete yet. So what we are looking at now when we evaluate the journal is the citations that the journal X received in 2013 to the articles published in 12 and 11. So that's the formula. And divide it and obtain a number. And, and please cover that's just a number. It means nothing if it's not put in context. It's a number. For uh, uh, an economics title, the top number in the category might be seven for the social sciences, but a journal with an impact factor of seven would be immediately uh, rejected by my colleague who handles uh, biotechnology or, I don't know, clinical medicine. Why? Because the journals uh, behave in different ways. Citation patterns are completely different. Uh, articles in the social sciences, because of the nature of the study of social sciences, over time, whether it's demographics, or um, um, anthropology, or whatever field it is. Those things don't happen as fast as a split of a molecule that is studied in biotechnology. Those researches, the researchers look at a longer span of time. And the citation takes longer to peak and to establish themselves. And they also are not that high. In the humanities, something may be cited today, just because there was a special on CNN and some PhD candidate decided to uh, to study, I don't know, William Chaucer's Canterbury Tales that were published uh, in the Middle Ages, and then nobody will write anything on it for the next five years. That's why we don't publish a JCR for the for the arts and humanities because it doesn't make any sense. There are no patterns in the arts and humanities. None. 